dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. I'd like to tell you of St. Margaret Clitheroe, the patron saint of Catholic businesswomen and entrepreneurs. This incredible woman left a legacy of courage as she gave up her life harboring priests and inspired her children to dedicate themselves to lives for God as well. Listen into this amazing tale of leadership from the inside. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. We've been looking at the different lives of the saints and trying to understand how they impact us and what we can learn from them as leaders. I think a lot of times people think of saints just in terms of, I don't know, their own weird definitions of spirituality, right? Which are kind of usually divorced from anything that's realistic or impactful or practical in their lives. And this is just a travesty, of course, because spirituality ought to be the most impactful of things, not the least impactful of things. I mean, I think this is so important because especially as business leaders, you don't have time for things that are not impactful. You're constantly making prioritization. You're constantly letting things go that you'd rather do that might be pleasant, but that you need to get this done, this done, this done. We are people of execution, of of drive, right? And so when it comes to spirituality, a lot of us for that same reason say, I'll do that when I'm retired. It's not that I don't love God. It's not that I don't love Jesus. It's just that I have so many other things that I need to do. And frankly, I'm I'm built for an action-driven life. Let's Let's just admit it. You don't get to where you are now by not being somebody who likes to move and do things. And spirituality just seems as if it's a place of stillness, calmness, peace, and therefore relaxation. So you'll give your spirituality as much time as you'll give your relaxation. And I guess you're right. You're like, once my business is built and then I'm, you know, living off of the profits or I sell my business, then I'll focus on spirituality. Maybe if you're lucky, but I'll tell you this, you'll have also missed out. You'll miss out on two huge advantages. The first blessing is that by incorporating real spirituality into your practical business life now will purify your spirituality. This is the point that I'm trying to make here. When we look at the life of St. Margaret of Clitheroe, we're going to see a woman who lived her life in her business, okay? But then the second thing that's going to, the second blessing that's going to happen is that your business itself and your productivity will be blessed by your faith. Okay, so your faith will be blessed by your business. Your business will be blessed by your faith. This is what happens when we bring the two together. And this is really what Catholicism is supposed to be, everybody. I mean, a faith that's divorced from your business life is a faith that you've rendered anemic because the greatest power in your life, by your own definition, is going to be your activity, your drive, your dreams, the different things that you're doing economically, the blessings and success that you're having, right? So then you're going to be like, well, that means what's my faith? And you're going to have a tendency to look down on the faith. And as a priest, I can tell you, I'll see it. I'll see it in people's eyes, you know? They're like, oh, you're a priest. Okay, you know, like, I don't have time for this. I've got to go make some deals somewhere, you know? And you're just kind of smiling because you're like, you're a fool. That's what you, you know, let me just tell you straight up. That is is the dumbest attitude in the world. If you think that making deals and making a ton of money or being productive in a million different ways is more powerful than faith, you have misunderstood truth in the deepest sense of the word. And why? Because faith is the most impactful of things because it forges identity in the most explosive of ways. This is, and it is also the most practical of things because it inspires action at a much deeper and more meaningful level than anything else. 
if I could get more faith into my soul, my business endeavors, my practical endeavors, my work endeavors, they would be full of a drive that's unearthly. <laughs> I won't just be doing things in order to get them d done. I'll be doing things as a servant of the Most High God. And you don't think that that makes for a great worker? If you don't, you've ignored all of Western history where these incredible monasteries, universities, hospital systems, school systems, where were they built with? Who were they built by? They were built by saints. And we're going to talk about one today. So before we go any further, let's go ahead and start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Come, O Holy Spirit, Father of the poor, breathe on us a spirit of inspiration, a spirit of love for you, a spirit of appreciation in front of your gifts. Help us to dare great things today, to hear your voice, and to never run from you and your call. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. John, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so let's talk about a woman who was named the patron saint for Catholic business women. What an incredible tale. What an incredible title. What an incredible person that she must have been to get that. And she's little known in that realm. And I think it's remarkable because we have such an uptick, of course, and a welcome presence of women in the professional world. And a lot of them are young entrepreneurs or just entrepreneurs, period, trying to make it in different ways while they balance their life with their family. And as they do that, they could say, gosh, isn't there anyone who's gone through this like me? Anyone who's done this with me, done this before? I think most of the time we look back and we say, well, obviously no Catholic women ever did this before. But that's simply not true. If you go back over history, you'll find this figure of Margaret Clitheroe. Margaret was married at age 18. So 18 years young, she married a widow who himself had two children from his previous marriage. And so you can imagine the courage of this young person. Her husband was much older than her. She had to assume two children. It's, this is into her first marriage. And her husband is not just anybody. Her husband, John, he's actually the son of the mayor of York. He serves as the church warden. He sits as a chamberlain in, of the city of York. Now, that, that equals, the chamberlain equals today what you would look at as in charge of all of the business of a city. So all the financial, almost like a CFO of the city, right? If you want to think of it that way. That would have been her husband's position in a very prosperous town. So she lived on the finest street in the town. It's called the Shambles. And you can go there today to the same ho home where she lived. There were something like 26 butcher shops along that street. That's why it's called the Shambles. It's an old English word for like where you'd hang the meat. And so it would have been a place of absolute commerce and business. And, Mar and, and young Margaret married right into that taking over two children at age 18. She's now a woman of prominence in this city, right? And so you could imagine, just like many, she would just go right into what everyone would expect her to do. And if she conformed, she would be successful. But little did they know the soul of this incredible, courageous leader, because conformity was not something she was about to do. Father Nathan is producing an ongoing source of videos to form, unite, and inspire you and your family. Go to eagleeyeministries.org. That's E A G L E E Y E ministries.org. And subscribe to Eagle Eye Pro. Subscribe today. You know, it's hard to imagine life in 1560, right? In England, we're so far removed from where we are today. But at the same time, there's something that was in common, and that's the demands of business and the, the relationship between business and faith, right? So her husband, especially at that time in Christendom, the, the unity of life was much greater than what it is today. So your faith was present in everything that you did and for the better. And sometimes there were some spots where that could have been purified. 
And so like when you run a business, of course, your status in the church, it helps your business. Your business helps your status in the church. And so the societal norms required attendance both at the church and in, in terms of business. So when Margaret, young Margaret at age 21, reading about the lives of the persecuted priests and the martyrs in England who had refused to give up their faith in order to acquiesce to the crown, to Henry VIII, she was inspired. She was inspired. She used to go at night, true story, to the place where they would execute the priests in York and she would kneel quietly there at night in prayer. Some would say praying that one day she would be a martyr. Who knows what she was actually praying for, but she was reverencing that spot of martyrdom. Now remember who this was. This was the wife of John Clitheroe, the daughter-in-law of the mayor. Right? This is, you, you don't do this. It's the chamberlain of the city in a city that required conformity to the crown for its very existence, right? The, econo the economy of York, all of that meat that was being sold there, etc. The commerce of that city. Well, this is, a, this is the city, the jewel of the crown in the north, right? Pushing up into Scotland. This is not a place where rebellion from, from the crown would be well rewarded. You know, this is the, if you look at the history of where she was, you know, the, the economy depended on you being there at every aspect, united. You're not in London. You've got, you know, the, the different cultures to the north. There's the city of York. Margaret's born right in there with a leader of the city. Conformity would have been the name of, to, of the game, where, how she proceeded forward. And yet, three years into her marriage, she decides to become Catholic, to convert. So she would, I mean, like, what, what, this, what this meant was that she would no longer go to the Church of England. So this was, she would therefore incur a crime called recusancy, where she would be absent from church, recusant, especially if she would do it on purpose or deliberately refrain from going to church. It was actually criminal. And so her husband, who's a, one of the most prosperous men in the town, right, and, and the church warden himself, has his own wife who's not going. So after that becomes, you know, the, the crime goes increasingly difficult, right? The, the, the state imposes higher and higher fines. Her husband is literally paying fines for his wife to not go to church, right, with him. Why? Because she's secretly at night going off and, you know, uh, uh, reverencing the ground where Catholic priests are being killed, so you could say, well, that's just fine if you're a Catholic, right? If you're not a Catholic, you're, you're looking at this saying like, well, this woman is crazy, right? At the same time, the reason she's the patron saint for the Catholic businesswoman is because she labored with her husband to the degree that was acceptable, of course, there in the business. She was helping him with their, his business. She was running the business side by side. So when you picture who this was, this was not a woman whose spirituality was somehow in the clouds while, you know, her, her business was floundering or who was removing herself from the exigencies of real life, you know, in order to meet Christ somewhere, you know, in the wilds. No, she lived on the shambles. You can go to her house to this day. It's still standing. It's a prominent home uh, at, on one of the most prominent streets in her town. She would understand the, the forces of the economy, how to help the people, what it would require for sales, all the social maneuverings that were necessary, and she engaged in them. At the same, why did she engage in them? She engaged in them because this was what it meant to be married to a business owner. This was what it meant to survive, and there was nothing wrong with it. In fact, it was where God had put them in order to thrive. It's, a, it's, really, it's really amazing. And so she did. And in that labor, she found holiness. While she was giving birth to children, she actually gave birth to two children before you know, she was finally arrested for not going to church. She actually went to jail. She went to the Tower of York three times, right, for a series of months once from November to February, that must have been fun. The Tower of York from November to February. Can you imagine that? Then she went again from October to April. 
And then finally from March all the way through January, three different times being imprisoned. Why for her Catholic faith, for not going to church. Uh, and she built in her home a place for priests to hide. Right? And then another one in her neighbor's house and another one in a second home that the family had. So she was using the prosperity in order to encourage the priests to hide away, say mass, and do their ministry for the salvation of souls. So this was obviously, at the same time, a big break from what was required of her socially. One time she said, well, she was reported to be in prison and she was pregnant, so she gave birth while in jail. They, sent, they allowed her a leave to go and give birth and then she came back again. And, and you could say, well, isn't that a terrible thing to do? And, and you can understand, you know, this is, the, this is the type of conscience question that a lot of people struggle with today. And Margaret had to answer that question. Should I do what I'm doing at the expense of spending my time with my children? Or is this not the very way for me to lead my children from the inside by inspiring them to be strong in their faith and to stand up? It's, it's easy on the outside to say, well, obviously she shouldn't have been going to prison and she shouldn't have been doing these things if she was married and had these kids. That should have been her first vocation. I think it's a different time. When you look at how things were then, how the children were reared then versus the standards of today, I don't think you can compare the two. In any case, I'm not prepared to because it's not what she did. It's not her story. And what she did do, I prefer to look at and try to see what you can admire in that and what you could admire is a lot. She chose to lead her children in conscience at a time when her own husband was not following his conscience. There's a tale of one time evidently he had drunk too much at some sort of gathering and he spent his time berating the Catholics, greatly upsetting his wife, obviously, who was one. And everyone knew that she was one because she had converted publicly. It hadn't become a penal, a capital offense to harbor a priest or all of this until later. It was just a, an economic offense, right? You had to pay fines for it. So here's her husband who marries this woman. She's birthing children for her, him. She's obviously following the conscience of her heart. And he doesn't pay any attention to it at all. He keeps on going his way. What is Margaret trying to do for her children? She's trying to say, your faith, your conscience needs to be a part of everything that you do, including your business. And, and she chose this means. And she, of civil disobedience and nonconformity. And as she did that, the think of the, the things that she suffered in terms of ridicule from others, in terms of misunderstanding from others, and even going to jail three different times for over a year spent in jail. She said that she learned to like it because she would fast like they did, offer her prayers up, and the regular schedule of prison life enabled her to live a deeper union with Christ in prayer. I mean, what a soul. What a woman. We were look at women. We think, that, oh, you know, they were all submissive people back then. They didn't do any. Look at how non-submissive this woman was to the state. And yet, at the same time, truly devoted to her family, as we're going to see. Father Nathan has founded the St. John Institute, the MBA program that develops students into the leaders of tomorrow by giving them a missionary's heart and an entrepreneur's mind. Visit our website at stjohninstitute.org. Dare great things for Christ. Margaret Clitheroe's life came to a, 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 an end after about 11 years of living here as a Catholic, harboring priests, having mass in secret, doing all these things, you know, on the sly, while at the same time laboring with her husband, supporting her husband, helping run that family business, and then rearing two children that weren't her own, giving birth to three more. Margaret, finally, the, the, the state issues a law that says it's a capital offense to harbor a priest and the first family that everyone goes for is the Clitheroes because they know of Margaret's devotion to the church. And so the police come into her house and of course they begin to terrorize the children until one of the little boys points to the cupboard. There was a secret cupboard where she had kept all that was necessary for mass in it. 
And when the boy was terrorized by the police, he pointed to the cupboard. They went to the cupboard. There they found everything for mass. And Margaret was arrested. Now, this is, you know, what, what a drama, right? She's got young children at home. She's rumored to be pregnant even now with her fourth child, right? They, they, they're unable to, to determine if she's pregnant or not. But they had a, a group of women ex do an official examination and it was determined that she could very well be pregnant. Uh, but at, she, at the trial, she refuses a jury trial, which was her right, because if she had had a jury trial, then the children of the home and her servants would have had to testify and either condemn their own mother to death, which would have been traumatic, of course, or they would have, and not only traumatic, but it would have been terrible because they would have been part of this evil of, of a woman being put to her death for her conscience. And, or, on the other hand, they would have lied and committed perjury. And either of those, Margaret realized, was not something that she was ready to do. Have her own children break their conscience when she had spent their whole, her whole life trying to encourage them to form their conscience. And so if you don't have a jury trial, uh, which would then give you a more serene way of dying, like getting your head cut off or something, <laughs> or being hung or something pleasant, I suppose. Instead, you were subjected without a jury trial to penalty that was hard and strong. Fort et dur. It's a French expression. And it, it just means that you're going to suffer even more. And suffer indeed she did. The penalty for harboring a priest with a, a, without a trial, which she had refused obstinately to do, uh, was that they'd put a sharp, small rock that's the size of a man's fist beneath your back, lay the front door of your home on top of you, and then pile rocks up, uh, up on top of you until you were literally crushed to death. And the small rock, sharp rock beneath your back was there to break your back as you lay there on the ground. Like, it was such a terrible death that the two sergeants of the city who were duly appointed to carry this out refused. They simply refused. They said, we cannot do this to a young woman. Margaret at the time, remember, was 34 years old. That's all the older she was. 34. And she's laying there on the back, on it with, you know, that's how she's going to die. So they took her to the bridge house, toll house, where this was to be done. They, they found four uh, street men, men of the street, no reputation, no job, no nothing, uh, who would be willing to do it for pay. And as they piled rocks on top of this young woman, who may have very well been pregnant, and had refused to testify or have testimony against her by her own family to save their souls, as she gave her life up in defense of her conscience and her religion and her desire to see Catholic priests be saved and do their mission. This wife of this wealthy and prosperous business who had also labored there and knew the importance thereof. Before she died, in an incredible gesture, the night before she died, she sent her shoes and her stockings to her one daughter, Anne with the message that she expected Anne to follow in her mother's footsteps. <laughs> Isn't that an eloquent symbol? Your stockings and your shoes to your daughter, telling her to follow in your mother's footsteps, meaning don't be afraid of anything. Stand as a strong woman and practice your faith unabashedly. And then she sent her hat to her husband with the message that she was and remained happy to be under his authority and sent her, her hat to him. So she walked without hat, without shoes, barefooted to the place of her final torture. Margaret, of course, succumbed. They said it took about 15 minutes. They piled 700 pounds atop her body and left her there for six hours and unspeakable. The night before she'd had a panic of fear and, and was ter deathly afraid of what was going to happen to her. And you can imagine again, that's of course totally to be understood. And that then though she had surrendered her life to God and she walked calmly and serenely and even joyfully, they said, to the place of her martyrdom. And I look at that and I say to myself, 
Well, what was at the source of Margaret's leadership? Number one, of course, was her faith. Here she was leading everyone in that village from the inside by saying, if you know the truth, then you should follow it. Right? She had this unity of faith and life that enabled her, even in the, even in the face of, of a faith that would cause her to death or cause her to suffer, would prefer to follow the truth than to live a life of accommodation just for this world. She believed in Jesus Christ and she was following Jesus Christ even though it was costing her what it cost her. So there, yet her faith itself was just an amazing source of her leadership. But I also see in Margaret her, a real understanding of the value of family. She's thinking of her children and her husband and sends her last testimony to both of them. But she never gave up who she was. You see, she didn't allow the life of business to impinge upon her faith but she also didn't allow her social status, her social obligations, and the, the requirements of her business to at the same time take away her deep identity and who she was, both in her devotion to her husband and her children, but also in her sense of conscience. In this way, Margaret Clitheroe shows us that the, the life of a successful person in this world doesn't have to be divorced from faith. In the end, her children did follow her example. Her two sons by birth gave, became Catholic priests. Her daughter, Anne, became a nun living in Belgium. And all of them bore witness to the strength of conscience. Margaret was an amazing young woman. She must have really been something to live with. So strong, so dedicated, so pious, and yet at the same time, so realistic just like every great leader needs to be. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.